preparing. Facebook. Does it say we're live in the screen? Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We are going to uh, give it a minute or so for the hordes of people. In it, guys, hordes of people. Everybody nod. Thank you very much. Just to show that you're all listening. Good, guys. Uh, hordes of people <laughs> to join us for the very first episode of Chats with Matt. Um, we are going to make this um, a bit of a series going forward. Just a general chit chat about things, dog, dog training or dog interest um, and sort of explore a few different topics. So um, Tam is, as always, in the background, going to be sharing this around a few different places. Um, Tam, can you let me know that it's all working all right? Yeah. yeah. yeah got people in already watching. How many have we got already? One. You're one. OK. We've got 10 already. Hey, guys, we're in double figures already. That's not bad, is it? I'm really pleased with that. Um, before I go and introduce these four handsome, handsome fellows, three. Oh, no, four, actually, because Louis's there. <laughs> that, it is Louis, isn't it? Yeah, you are. Yeah, Louis. I mean, you know, that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the winner. Tam, can they see all four of us on the screen at the same time? Yeah. Excellent. Um, tonight, as all the chats with Matt is uh, sponsored by... Uh, trusted dog products um, and we've got a giveaway tonight of can I guys can I have an ooh after each product please that'd be really cool we've got some insecta nibbles some cricket nibbles ooh thanks ooh. That, thanks Ads. Well done, good. Me, that's all right that's all right <laughs> Matt, don't worry. Um, some meat crunchies ooh. Ooh. some um, Simpsons duck ooh. Ooh. Uh, good um, some pig's ears ooh. Ooh. Some fish bites <laughs> and some fish cubes. So this is all available, including these, as a giveaway tonight. And all you need to do to be in a chance of winning is tag three people um, in a comment um, in this talk. So if you tag three people at the end of the evening, when we're just about to wrap up and these guys are ready to go and, I don't know, crawl somewhere and go and have a rest, we will uh, choose a winner and then you can get in touch with us to receive your prize. Going to so nip off to time? Facebook to tag some people. Sorry, so what was that, Tom? Just going to nip off to tag some people. Yeah, that's, that's fine, pretty Tom. good. Yeah, you do it. As you do it too, Nick, get on it. That's fine. You tag some people <laughs> in this. Uh, Hello, Sarah, Ellen. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Ellen. Uh, Emma, Jack. Hi, Emma. Hi, Jack. Jake. Hi, Jake. Ruth, Ollie. Hi, Ruth and Ollie. Yeah, and, other people. and other people are watching. Fantastic. So um, I think, guys, without further ado, we should get into what tonight's all about. So I contacted, well, first of all, I contacted Adam and Adam, you know, then put me in contact with a few other guys about tonight and the topic of tonight about being four chaps, our route to training in what is quite a female heavy community would you say with trainers really quite a lot of you know that the sway really is the other way of what our route to training was why we chose the route that we do um and you know some of those misconceptions sometimes that go along with the sorts of training that we do and some of the things that we might like to try and put right so who is feeling brave enough to say well this is what i did this is how i do it this is what i do anybody what well, adam good excellent <laughs> as the host, it, uh, then uh, it's. You want me to go yeah. first? Well, I mean, as the host, it would be it would be a good option. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, <laughs> Adam, um, it's my, part of the reason why I do what I do. Actually, is is down to you, to be honest. Um, so, I was using different training method, different training methods, five six years ago, um, and a, a mutual friend of ours called Pip the Vet that was at Ashman Joan Vet Group at the time said actually. Go and see this guy, Adam. He sort of knows what he's about. And, and I spent 45 minutes with Adam. And it was, I think we've all probably had it where you spend some time with someone and you just go, actually, I've learned more in 45 minutes in being with you than I have with doing other stuff that maybe I've tried to discover myself or whatever. And we were da you were down at your old site ads. Uh, um, down in Summer Lane, wasn't it? Down in Summer Lane. And yeah. we took Marley and Cody down there and it was just... A complete flick of the switch and then it's just one of those things where my route into it is a bit, bit more about I, I sort of 
um, put it a bit more like dads going to taking their sons or their kids to football. If you go, you watch for a bit, and then someone says, oh, do you want to help? And then someone says, actually, do you want to teach a class? And then do you want to go and do this course? And then it just snowballs into this big thing that actually now becomes, well, for me, you know, um, Southwest Dog Skills and all the other things that go with it is my life and is a huge passion about what I do. Um, and absolutely initiated from you, Adam. So thanks to you for that. And that's uh, that's my route into it anyway. And, and Adam sort of... Um, been a been a bigger it, it's not me it's not the me and adam show but i am i am hugely grateful for what for what adam's done for us so uh, that's my he's room. gone all red now look <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no he hasn't gone <laughs> 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 just clear the throat a little bit there i really appreciate that man yeah. yeah so uh anyone else because i think some of you had maybe have a, a more traditional route through university and that sort of thing haven't you yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, I think both of us have, if I know your background well enough, Tom. But um, yeah, obviously, I, I well, when I started doing training, um, I think like probably most dog trainers, I got into dog training because everything was going wrong, you know, and there was like a pivotal moment for me where my dog almost got hit by a car. And that kind of sh shook me up enough that I realized I needed to learn about dog training. And then from talking to people and getting pointed in various directions to learn about dog training, Initially, I started off going to kind of all all that all the kind of outdated information. So I was training dogs in a pretty harsh and kind of outdated way. And then, um, I mean, and then kind of ironically, like through getting in arguments with people, like online and stuff like that, like really trying to defend what I was doing, um, I decided, well, okay, I'll read. You know, I'll read. I'll open my you know, I'll, I'll look at some of this other information and um, I start, it was really reading Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor that really, you know, changed a lot for me. And then it was a gradual process from there. And then I went to university and did a degree in canine behavior and training and kind of things went from there, really. So that, that's kind of my background. Cool. So mine's kind of similar and different. So I remember the first training book I got, my parents brought me from a car boots hill um, when I was still at school. And I didn't really know at that point what I wanted to do, but um, from a young age, I kind of wanted to be a vet. So I was doing a lot of work experience and I ended up um, volunteering for a local rescue. And at that point I was kind of like, oh, this is definitely where I want to go. So I'm a rescue and behaviorist and trainer at the minute. But I still kind of had this veterinary idea in mind. So I did bio veterinary science as an undergrad. Um, and then it was through that course, um, I started seeing, observing cases that were undertaken by the clinic in University of Lincoln. And that was kind of what made me think actually, yeah, the sort of behavior and training route is where I want to go. And then I did my master's before then starting um, as a behaviorist in, in a rescue right. after graduating. Cool. I think it's worth saying though, Matt, like, because I get asked this question a lot is I think sometimes people might, you know, hear that we've gone to university and think that if they want to become a dog trainer, they absolutely have to go to university. And that really puts them off the idea. Mm -hmm. And actually nowadays, there are so many options that weren't available not that long ago. So you don't actually have to go and uh, go to university and do a degree to become a dog trainer. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, I wouldn't, I, I would never put myself in a behaviorist bracket I, 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 and, you know, cases come in and people come and contact us and they say, you know, do you work with X, Y, and Z? And, I, and, and I'm very open to understanding my knowledge and my limits, if that makes sense, it, it, and, and refer, refer on to people. And I think, you know, I've referred people on to both Adam and Nick uh, for other work. And I think that vocational route for some people and, and for me as, as uh, someone who found education difficult and quite, challenging i think some of the routes that are available now those more practical vocational routes that you can take absolutely suit my learning style where maybe that more traditional model of education which as you go higher up gets more funneled into this is how you must learn um wouldn't have suited me at all so for me to go the routes that maybe you would have took probably would have disengaged me hugely but the opportunities that i've been given a, through, I think, what's been thrown up by the pandemic of people being more creative about how they deliver courses and the more opportunities you've got to learn. Plus, you know, 
with dog training, the skill of, of, of working with a dog and working with, with people being that practice, practical skill anyway, I think as long as you are understanding of where you are and where your knowledge base is, I think there's a lot of avenues that don't mean, yeah, that mean that you don't necessarily need to do that classic um, uh, university route. Definitely. Absolutely. Mine, yeah. about... Mine was the kind of the university route as well, but had it been, had I gotten into the training now, possibly might not have needed to do the uni route, but at the time I'd left school, I had a dog at 14, which is how I got into training. Um, first training class that we went to, it was, a, it was a guy who used pretty kind of traditional methods at the time. So you kind of go in, um, check chains were readily available on the side and you, you do your work and then you go again. Um, and it never really sat right even from, from then. Um, so a, a college course opened up nearby. So I went from school to college, uh, did two years national diploma in animal husbandry and then moved on to the three year um, degree in really? Bishop Burton. Uh, because like Nick was saying, is that it was kind of the done thing. That was kind of the route through if you wanted to do something. So yeah, had it been now, maybe wouldn't have gone through that. But um, I, I do kind of mention it quite a lot because I, I, the reason being is that I'm just glad that I stuck it out for three years. <laughs> it just like carried on all the way through and got to the end of it. So yeah, it's... Uh, it, I had yeah, the same experience. Kind of <laughs> yeah. well, I think I that's a really good point though, isn't it? Because Adam and Nick have both said it and Nick said about kind of um, and you kind of said it as well, Matt, about n that style not really suiting everybody. Yeah. And I think it's the same. Everybody kind of says, oh, because oh, I've got a master's, like, oh, you must be really academic. And I'm not at all. Like, I was just really lucky to have a really good support system while I was at uni and an interest in the subject, which I think is a massive driving force anyway. But there was definitely times where you kind of struggle through it. So I think it is right to say it's, it's definitely not the right route for everybody. It's got a place in the industry. But I think, yeah, there's so many different routes to get people where they want to be. It's yeah, really it's important actually, to kind of just acknowledge that. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And um, actually, I got the sense then from what Adam said that maybe we kind of had the same approach because... Um, I, I didn't want it to sound like I was being negative about university because actually it was a really great experience, but it, in hindsight, it probably didn't really suit me, but at the time it felt like the only option. So I think it's great now that there are so many options and ways that people can get in. Absolutely. And, and I think the route, the, the, the potential specialisms within dog training actually is, is there's a lot of difference in approaches as well, isn't it? That maybe from that classic um, maybe what sort of university you, so we are you know huge advocators of um, and you know animal centered education of that more holistic approach of considering the dog's physical well-being and as you got you know as we all would look at pain and and discomfort and that sort of thing and I don't know sometimes that the classical model of you know that operant type stuff that maybe you get more I don't know maybe it's it's slightly, I don't know, because I didn't do the university thing to know what that course is like, but there is such a wide spectrum of dog training and approaches to dog training now, isn't there? That I don't know whether you guys felt that you got that from that course or actually have your, has your knowledge expanded at, since university? But I think that's another really important point is it's not just about having that degree and there'll be a variety of practical and, and other experience within the degree but I think w whatever university you go to it's always as much about what you put in as what you get out and I think even when you graduate that's not the end like you constantly adjust what you're doing I know Nick Adam and me well we were just talking about it before we came live weren't we we all still do a huge amount of CPD because we're actually quite a new industry and, and I think that's where all of these different routes have come from as well as a lot of people have wanted to kind of do this stuff for a while and but it it wasn't a job a, a couple yeah. of years ago no, so no. we're we're seeing this kind of movement into the industry mm. and that's driving the knowledge and the experience and you know we know there's tons of different ways to achieve the same goal and actually mm. having a broader toolbox as possible is going to mean that we can get as many dogs as possible as possible to that kind of point that we well the owners need them to be or we need them to be um in my case yeah i, I suppose that's that's quite an interesting point actually to consider is not long ago 
the main route into dog training was a dog training club that was run but you know it was a it was a voluntary organization that's where I started you know it was agility club that started my interest in in working and learning about dogs and that was just um, a good fun experience and now there's a huge over the last five six years maybe has it progressed to more of a a professional industry there are still those clubs out there and, and they're a great starting point and I you know and I would never um, take away from the experience that that club gave me but it's only as time's gone on hasn't it that actually as an industry it's become a profession and something that is seen I suppose in the same light as a as a tradesman really as the skill level to do your job at the highest level you, you it's a craft isn't it it's uh it's something you acquire over time it's you know like you said Tom you know having all these different tools in your toolbox just like you know, my dad as a builder had, you know, we, he had a, to, a toolbox full of all sorts of bits and pieces that he's gathered along the way. And I suppose for us, that's what goes in there, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And you, you do get better for experience. You know, I think everyone would say that they've learned a huge amount, if not more, from that practical experience through just years of seeing cases. You know, I think you just, you, you start seeing the same things over and over again. You naturally you experiment you try different things and you just that's you just improve and, and get better as as the years go by and i think the big difference for us is we've got two clients in any case because we've got a dog and an owner so we constantly need to change how we approach problems because the dog might be doing really similar behaviors but the other end of the lead could have completely different learning styles completely different abilities or interests, which is part of what we're going to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so it kind of makes our job that much more difficult because we've got two people or two beings that we're trying to uh, match our training to. Absolutely. So go, going back, go, let's let's cast our mind back to, to the first point where actually you thought, well, dog training, dog education, you know, working in that, as a career choice, when when for you guys did you feel that actually this is something that I want to go ahead and do? Were you always, you know, I, I remember reading, um, and I suspect we've all read it, um, Steve Mann's Easy Peasy Puppy Squeezy, where he talks in the, in the early part of his book about being, you know, the, the, the weird dog kid that was just always picking dogs up from the street and training them and working for them. And, and yes, I had dogs as a kid. Um, you know, my background before before doing this was was working in education so I worked in special special educational needs for 12 years so that human end has always been a really important point for me and and being able to interact and work with people has always been you know a crucial part of of what we do but for you guys what was what was the point what what made you do it what made you do what you do now well for me I mean I started getting interested like I said when I started having problems and then once I started, I just started really enjoying it. So I, you know, with, then I went on to just train my dog anything, right? Like random tricks and and doing like more advanced stays and all of that kind of stuff. And I was just really enjoying doing it. And maybe this is something that a lot of people wouldn't admit, but for me at that time, I just became like a super fan of Caesar Milan. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing ever. This guy just works with dogs all the time and like rehabilitates them and he's making such a difference. And I just thought it was so cool. And I think that that actually probably was the spark for me where it's like, I want to do what that guy's doing. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, I, you know, I started going to university and obviously my views about how to train dogs changed, but that same like desire to rehabilitate train you know dogs was was there no matter what methods we use to achieve that mm. and i suppose really approaches now a polar opposite really to what you what you were doing in those early stages and and when that was what was thrust into the limelight and what was really the only thing on on the box that you could see that was dog training sure. then why would you you know i i started off you know, Adam was my very, very first introduction that for, of, of reward of reward based training, positive training, whatever you want to call it. You know, we, the, the guy that we worked with before, um, that was that was what he did. And why would you not believe him? 
you know, and, and, then, and then this world opens up. And I think for me now, it's more less, ab- it, it, it's completely more based on ethics and values on an individual level now is what's important to you within what makes you feel comfortable with what you're doing what about what about, what was what was your route ads uh so coming out of uni um i took a bit of a year out <clears throat> i was in a bit of limbo actually me, me me dad had died when i was 21 so i had like a kind of a year of not really doing much and then i was um just doing kind of part-time work here and there and then a friend of a friend introduced us to a trainer down at um bath dog training club down in Whitcomb. Mm-hmm. And so I just popped in. She said, oh, you know, come in, sit in, watch, help out if you need to. And I spent weeks and weeks just going in on a Tuesday night, just watching, um, helping out with classes. Cause I'd never really had that much practical experience by then. I had all the theory side of things. Well, mm-hmm. as much as my brain could manage, but the practical side was still lacking. So I just used to sit, watch, help out. And then weeks after week after week, then I'd maybe help out with an exercise or a couple of exercises. Then I'd keep watching, do a class. And it got to the point where I just, was looking forward to those Tuesday nights above everything else in the week. Um, and then it got to the point where I think I've got to, you know, I've got to do something now. I've got to make this kind of change. Um, and then that was it. Set, set the business up, uh, which was 11 in um, April, just gone. Fourth, fourth of April. 11 years ago. That was 11 years ago. Wow. And, and back then it was like, oh, you'll never make a living at this. And I was like, well, yeah. I need to work for somebody else. Even if it fails, at least I don't have to work for someone else. <laughs> yeah, people <laughs> say that to me as well. It just snowballed from there. Wow. Yeah, and it, and it does that, doesn't it? And, and, you know, you had that person, that first welcome experience of someone that said, just come in and watch, just, just come in and look. And, and I think for all of us, you know, Tom may be slightly different because of, of your working role at the minute as a as a behaviourist um, within a rescue. But for me, if anybody ever wants to come and sit and watch a class or come and see what goes on or come and see what we do, I think it's it opens up that possibility for someone that's just going well and willing to dip, drop me pen, someone that's willing to dip their toe in the water and just and 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 put themselves out there a little bit. I think it's our responsibility to, yeah, come on in, come and sit and watch or come and see or, you know, whatever, just as a, a way in so that they can start to understand actually, because I think there are some some misconceptions about what we do and how we do things. And maybe it's a bit woolly and maybe it's a bit hairy fairy and a bit fancy, but actually it's not, it's, it's quite simple. It's quite fair. And th- does that make sense? Does, does, yeah, someone else. I, I want to make a public apology to anybody who who asked to come in shadow classes when I very first started. <laughs> when I was first setting the business up, it was like this little baby that I had, and I was like, no, 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 I just need to build this up and get it to grow. And then a year or two into that, I was like, oh, actually, I, I can share information with anybody at that point. And and the more you share, the more connections you make, the better it gets for you as well. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's I think that's a really important thing as well is that you're not just on your own, even though you're self-employed or some people who work for themselves, you're not just on your own. There's so many people out there who are happy to help and then people who are getting into it there's people like us who are then happy to help them now as well so. yeah and i think and, and, lots of people worry that it's going to create that competition right like they're going to volunteer with you for a bit and then they'll be like nah bugger this and go and set up on their own but actually i think particularly with the the dog world at the minute with the pandemic and everything i don't think dogs availability is going to be the problem moving forward so i think the more people we have like adam says to bounce off each other to refer people to because even you know we've already mentioned a little bit about referring on past your skill set and that that goes for all of us i know we all refer like clients on for various reasons but actually sometimes you just don't want to work with another reactive shepherd because you've already got five on the books (laughs) and you want to kind of get through some before you move another one or it might just be that somebody's come to you to do agility like you said Matt I have no interest in doing agility training I've done it in the past but you know it's not something at the minute that I'd be like yeah definitely I want to spend time doing that so it's going to be much better for me to pass that on to somebody who's Mm -hmm. actually interested in it and it works the same at rescue for some strange reason I really like working with the big grabby dogs um So you tend to end up working with all of them because nobody else really enjoys being grabbed by a 40 kilogram bull breed, but (laughs) you know, I become the muggins that does it. So, you know, even within our own organizations, or if you've got a business like Adam, where you've got different people helping out, even if it's occasionally, you've got to know 
that group strength and um it just makes everything much easier even like adam said if you're self-employed you still kind of need that that group and even if it's just to go for a coffee outside at the minute um and Good point, just man. talk Good through point, what's man. happening yeah i know <laughs> gotta keep on on the guidelines um but you know just go and talk about what's happened because we're all gonna have crap weeks we're all gonna have clients that are difficult or we just need to talk through things to get better ideas or different ideas or even just hear somebody say yeah i do exactly the same as what you've just said to me which i say a lot to people and particularly in my current role where i'm supporting a lot of people doing the job that i do um quite often i just say yeah that's exactly what i would do i wouldn't change any of it because mm. sometimes that's what we just need mm. so what 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 ignited things for you tom what, what kicked off your obviously we know your educational route but you know, you said you were keen to be a vet. Has as, as animals always been a thing for you? Has it been, you know, something you've always been keen on or interested in? What was, where did it come from? Yeah, so I've yeah, always kind of had that interest in animals. I did want to be a vet to start with, but I, I think, well, I think the interest definitely was there in terms of a vet, but we've already mentioned that there kind of wasn't, you don't really feel like there's that many other options when you're in school. Um so that was kind of on the radar but yeah I've always had that kind of interest and dogs in particular um which is quite strange really because we never had dogs growing up didn't get my first family dog until I was maybe 15 so it was quite late really I'd already kind of made my mind up that this was the route I wanted to go into and then um like I said it was it was kind of volunteering for local rescues and I was lucky it was a small local rescue which meant I got to do a lot of different things and that kind of experience allowed me to say like oh training and behavior is kind of the route I want to go down although like I said I wasn't actually even sure until I finished my undergraduate degree and then in the last year I kind of started vol um, volunteering in the university's puppy classes and watching consults like I said and that was what kind of solidified that idea of yeah behavior training and behavior is, is my particular interest and it just happened to be that rescue is what particularly catches my attention mm. brilliant fantastic and I think you know we've all we've all talked about our ways in to this and I think we've always had that opening up that sort of eye-opening moment of going actually yeah this is this is a style this is a technique this is a way that actually really fits and sits well with with you as a person you know obviously you know techniques at the beginning maybe is different to what we use now and, and I feel a very very different trainer a very different person to what I started off being because of, of an, a situation where I felt I was given information that made me feel really comfortable and made me want to have that thirst for knowledge that thirst for learning and I think as as professional dog trainers now that sort of our jobs now isn't it actually as soon as our clients come in or that you know the the the, the rehoming people for you to or whatever it's that it's we're trying to ignite that lifelong passion for for dog training whether that's um you know just trying to teach a recall whether that's tricks and skills whether that's a certain activity just trying to bring in actually that the, the the dog is a, is on a continuum isn't it it's on a lifespan that actually that changes massively and, and their abilities change hugely and we have to keep adjusting as we go doesn't it so i think for us to try and instill what those people in originally instilled in us is part of our duty isn't it i feel it is part of my my duty to go out and do that and spread the word about what we do i said that sounded really preachery it didn't mean to i didn't mean to. i got me soapbox a little bit then i do apologize but uh, nick what do you think well i think we should i i think you're right matt i think that kind of part of our role or at least that's how i kind of see part of my job is trying to empower people through dog training to have the confidence to be able to include their dogs in their lives more you know that's kind of one of my realizations over the last few years is you know there's a lot of people that go out and do things and they don't feel comfortable to take their dog you know whether that's like going to a cafe or even stuff that maybe seems a bit more out there like going on a bike ride or going paddle boarding or you know whatever right like there's so many things that people do and they don't feel like they can take their dog because they're worried about their dog's behavior so I think it's really important a part of our job is empowering them to be able to kind of create a stronger relationship with their dog. And I think a lot of people don't realize that's necessarily what they want. 
when you're pulling your hair out because your dog's doing all of these horrible, you know, these horrible things. But I know when, for me, when I wanted to get a dog, like when I wanted my first dog, I kind of had some like, I had a lot of like idyllic visions of what owning a dog would be like, right? Like, you know, like you see those movies where you, you do like watch like Lassie and like you see these dogs that are just like following people along and it just looks really cool. Like, you know, that companionship and that dog that just is just perfect. Um, that's what I kind of envisioned dog ownership to be like before I had a dog. And I think, although I, I don't want to put pressure on anyone to feel like they have to have the perfectly behaved dog, I think we should try to get to a point where, you know, the dog's well behaved enough that we can have a really strong relationship with them and incorporate them more in our, into our lives, as opposed to having to leave them at home all day because we're worried about them embarrassing us. Yeah, I see that. And I think it kind of links into that empowering side, though, because Nick said perfect dog and then said well behaved. And actually, that, de that definition of a well behaved dog is going to be completely different, even for us four sat here. Sure. So we're not doing the majority of the training with these dogs. The owners are. So it, it's got to be about empowering them and, and giving them the skills, because most of the time we're not doing... 90 99 probably actually of the really? training that's happening with this dog um also just just before we jump to somebody else i've just had a text message to say that i was really mean about german shepherds so i apologize i do actually like shepherds but they do happen to be quite well, reactive it, 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 it was is when you when you said about you know who wants to take on another german shepherd i expected adam to do this i only used it as an example because i got barked at one yesterday the, the, the person was yeah. like they'll be he'll be fine he'll be fine and i was like he's gonna bark at me, he's gonna bark at me. <laughs> and then i literally like said hi and he just barked straight on me and i was like told you <laughs> yeah. yeah no i do lo i do love shepherds but i'm not blind to their uh to their tra some of their traits more common <laughs> traits but um and also it, it, i think it's going on what we were covering there it's important to, to to have a look at the person's mindset as well when they're when they're dealing with the dog is you might get somebody who comes and said, oh, he's doing all these bad behaviours. And I, I try not to look at it as good or bad behaviour. I try and look at it as wanted or unwanted behaviours because if you start to look at bad behaviours, then you get a mindset of maybe like a bad dog. And we, you know, we know there's no such thing as a bad dog. It's just the dogs are doing something because they feel like that's necessary. And once we start to coach the owners and kind of get them to understand why the dogs are doing what they're doing, a little bit of understanding can actually go a long way before you've even put any training in, just getting them to understand what's happening and why it's happening can sometimes be a massive relief for, for clients. And it just helps them just to go, actually, do you know what? Maybe we've got a chance here and we can do some work with the dog. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. You, they've got to put all the work in. We do a little, maybe an hour or some coaching in the meantime as well, but you know, they've, they've got to want to stick at it and they've got to want to enjoy doing it as well. And sometimes it's just about changing the way people think as well, like you just said, because... I'm a really lazy trainer. So like if there's stuff that I don't need to do, I'll definitely try and avoid it. And I remember having a discussion with somebody on Facebook about um, resource guarding between two dogs in the home. And I was like, just feed them separate. And he's like, yeah, yeah. But then, then like, then what do you do? Like, and I was like, well, you could do this really complicated desensitization cattle conditioning plan and get them gradually closer to each other and make it really super happy. But I said that whilst you're doing that, the owner's going to have to feed them separate anyway, at which point 90% of owners are going to come back to you and be like, hey, so you know you said to feed them separate. That's working really well. I no longer need you, which yeah. is what I want because, like I said, I'm super lazy mm -hmm. when it comes to stuff. But um, like Adam said, I think sometimes it's actually about talking the problem through with them and getting them to understand that actually it might not be a bigger problem as you're seeing it, but if it is these are the things that we can do to help you to make it less of a problem or no problem at all, which then links back to what Nick was saying, doesn't it? About how do these dogs fit into your life and how can we improve that for you? Yeah, I totally agree, Tom. Yeah, I think that there are definitely times where you have to have that conversation with people about whether the, like, whether the juice is worth the squeeze, right? Like, it, you know, is there a management situation here that, uh, is going to be preferable to weeks and weeks of training but at the same time you know um, I was thinking back to what Matt was saying about like 
the misconception that sometimes the, the way that like reward based training being fluffy and like I, I think one thing that kind of irks me a lot is sometimes I feel like as reward based trainers we spend huge amounts of time talking about ethics and I, I do understand that that's necessary but sometimes I think that we start developing this misconception that the only reason we do what we do is because it's kinder to the dog and at least for me I don't think that's true I, I probably the more important part of the reason I do what I do is because it's more effective and I think that that's more important to clients as well you know clients that are really struggling they're looking for the solution to their answer they're not necessarily looking for you know the the idea of who's most ethical probably isn't immediately coming into their mind they're just looking for the solution so that's just one of my personal frustrations about the misconceptions about reward based training is you know that we, that we only do it because it's more ethical and actually for me at least the biggest reason i do it is because it's more effective i think i think the engagement in it is is going to be wide ranging isn't it I think that that's that's the thing, isn't it? Is is it, it it must in some way, shape, or form, whether you see a result really quickly, or you think that you, you've had another route and then you've come to try us, and actually you've seen that the dog maybe relaxes more or whatever. That there's there's a wide range of reasons why it's going to suit that person, um, and I think our job is is absolutely first of all is to really get to understand where that person is on their journey of. Um, making adjustments and making changes for their dog or making things better from their dog and start from there. I think when we, sometimes there can be, you know, that we set our stall out and they've got to try and meet us in terms of expectations. And that's where you can get, you know, I, I feel you can get huge disengagement because actually you've got, we've got to go down and go, right, these are the building blocks that we're going to take to make that I can't talk without my hands. I'm sorry, guys, they're going all over the place. Um, I'm conscious of, of your guys' time because it, it's really valuable and I, I really appreciate you being here. Two things I want to do, though, guys, is just very quickly plug our competition. Woos are, again, please, if you can. So these are all the prizes that you guys can win um, just by... Hang on, it takes two hands. Uh, tagging three people in this. <laughs> Thanks, Ad. Um, but um, I wanted to talk more about so, because you know um getting four blokes together to talk about training and all getting along and doing very nicely at it is quite rare sometimes i think in the world of social media it can get quite um tense sometimes and i tend to try and stay away from those conversations because it just really stresses me out i don't keep all worrying it just makes me sweat but if we could have an opportunity just to talk about some of the things that you hear about the training styles that we do and the way that we do train that actually aren't aren't necessarily right or understood in the wrong way what sort of things would they be and also those people that are watching if you've got any questions for us we are going to save uh five minutes at the end for questions so don't forget to put your questions in the chat in the comments below but what would, what would those things that you hear either from people that are clients or from because I, I meet people that haven't got dogs that have an opinion on how to train dogs that have never had a dog and I'm like where does this opinion come from where who have you watched who have you listened to down the pub whatever but you know what what do you guys think I think yeah, for me the the biggest sorry Nick the biggest no, one ahead. is pos positive isn't permissive so positive training isn't about just letting the dog do whatever they want or however they want to do it like we've already kind of talked about, it's about actually how did the dogs fit into our life, but with us giving them the best life that they can have, because they don't have the choice to be there ultimately. But what we want to do is make them fit our our life and, and what we want out of dog ownership, but make sure we do it in a way that gives them the best opportunity to be them as well. Absolutely. I love yeah. that. It's true. Yeah, I, I was going to say one of the ones I come across a lot is that positive training doesn't work for X breed, uh, especially big breeds, right? Like Rottweilers, German Shepherds, etc., Dobermans. And um, that is like just hilarious as a notion because, you know, the, the guarding breeds particularly, which are usually the breeds that people are referring to, uh, are usually very easily motivated by food and tug and, and tug toys and games if you know how to do it. 
And obviously, if you engage with a positive dog trainer, the, the skill, they're going to show you how to do it. So, um, yeah, that's that's the, the one that I hear, which kind of always makes me laugh a little bit. I mean, when you look at all of these do those dogs in roles, you know, we've been talking about German Shepherds today. You look at German Shepherds and the police that are being rewarded with tennis balls and tug toys and stuff like that. It's just abundantly obvious that positive training does work for large breeds and and any breed. Yeah. Well, I mean, and any animal. Yeah. yeah. Very good Definitely. point. Yeah. yeah. So we've got um we've got a year old Rhodesian Ridgeback and absolutely hear it from from a community all the time you know they're they're aloof they're stubborn they're da ba 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 and actually so a group of trainers um have got together and who have also got ridgebacks and uh, started a um a training advice group with a with a, a, a reward based mentality mm -hmm. uh, just to try and change that narrative that maybe goes on absolutely nick with those breeds of you know they're aloof they're stubborn they'll do it on their terms etc etc we just need to find their motivator and sometimes their motivator sometimes their reinforcer you know john t is a massive physical being he loves a nose touch he loves a middle he loves all those things as an alternative reinforcer you give him a piece of sausage and he'll spit it back out at you but you you find what works for him and he's fantastic but um you know We've got to be w willing to go to those. What reinforce? I think we could have another chat about reinforcement because reinforcement it, for me is huge. Is so wide ranging, and we go for the classic food and uh, you know food because primary reinforcer. Right, I get it. But you get a, a, a dog like Jonty that is not food motivated. We've got to understand the reasons why, and we're doing a lot of work under, understanding why he's not necessarily primarily food motivated. But it makes you go to those other places to go, right, we need to teach you these skills to be safe, to live happily, to coincide with us and our world. What lengths do we need to go to to find your reinforcement? And I think that's the, that's the big thing sometimes, isn't it? Ads, have you got any little gems that you hear? Yeah, it's interesting you said about the food. I, I, I was, this must have been a couple of years ago, but I was called a cookie pusher. And, uh, and, the, and the idea is, is that I just turn up, ram treats down the dog's throat and hope for the best. Because that's kind of put, that's what with the term positive reinforcement means to some people, but it's not really about reward. It's like you just said, it's about reinforcement and what the dog, what motivates the dog, and what reinforcer you can use, and being able to 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 assess the dog and go, well, actually, treats aren't going to work at this point, but maybe giving them access to a different space or giving them access to something else that might be the reinforcer to start with. So it's yeah, it's looking at what reinforces the dog rather than just cramming trees down i saw a, a brilliant sketch it, ages ago and it was a cartoon and it just there was a there's a cartoon dog hanging on to somebody's leg and the caption said oh i'm just going to wait for him to let go and then i'll click and treat <laughs> and I was like, you know that's that's what the assumption is is that we just wait for the good stuff but actually it's about steering them down that avenue that is that is more appropriate for the dog and for the person as well rather than just always wait for the good stuff and trying to ignore the bad i think we've moved on a lot since then absolutely definitely um so if, if there are people out there that are maybe um, thinking about approaching uh, a reward-based trainer for some help or are thinking of, you know, like we have, making a career and a lifestyle out of it, what would, what would, be, your, what would be your sort of tips into it? And, and Tam, have we got some questions? Yeah, we, and then we'll go to some questions as well before we wrap up. So what, what's your, your top tips for, for either as a client or as a, as a trainer? Choose which one you'd rather do. So if you want to become a dog trainer, is that what you mean? Well, if you either, either you could do a top tip for becoming a dog trainer or approaching a, a reward-based trainer as a client with a dog. You can do I, either. I think if you want to become a dog trainer, I think um, probably the best thing to do is try to shadow someone as opposed to even going on a course because, well, I mean, that's, that's unfair because there are courses which are kind of introductions to the subject, but um you know, before you go ahead and dedicate yourself to three years of study or whatever, it's probably a good idea to, to realize whether you actually do want to do this as a career, in which case uh, trying to contact people and, and do some shadowing, uh, whether that's just assisting in classes is a very normal route for people to start out on, um, uh, or even just attending classes, right? Just start training your dog more and uh, try to, you know, realize whether that's something that you do want to pursue. Cool. Great. 
Anybody? I'm gonna I'm gonna sure. do the obvious thing here as well and, and just add to Nick's and plug rescues because I think there's a really easy way to get access to a lot of a variety of dogs, breeds, individuals, and that's by volunteering for a local rescue because it's gonna give you a range of knowledge and it's gonna really help them out. Lots of rescues don't have access to trainers and um, definitely not for free. And um if if you're interested and you, you're going down that path, it's a great way to help them out whilst gaining the experience for yourself. What's the situation at the moment, Tom, with COVID and all that sort of thing with volunteers coming in? That's it. I know, like, obviously, different rescues might have different policies, but what, uh, for your knowledge, what what's the what's the route in at the minute? Is yeah, it- so it's it's definitely pretty varied. Um, it is it is like on the approved list so people can definitely volunteer so i think the best bet is just to contact your local rescue say this is what you're interested in in particular um and just see see what their views are because lots of rescues will take people on um in stages as well so definitely just getting your name out of there getting interested and sometimes it can even just be like well we don't have any like on-site spaces at the minute but you can come and take this dog for a walk off site and yeah. you can still achieve the same thing there because you can just go somewhere quiet and you can still work on lucid walking or you know jumping up or whatever that dog's doing or just fun stuff like a day out of kennels for that dog learning some really simple scent work or stuff like that is going to be like make the world of difference to their week absolutely cool adds anything to it i yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a little plug as well for a couple of organisations that are that are that are like so the APDT is one they do they do training courses and assessments um, as well and then the other one is the VSPDT which is the Victoria Stillwell um, Positive Dog Trainers so you can do online courses with those guys or um, you can do a six month course where they buddy you up with a trainer in your area to shadow work with gain all the information you need plus your online kind of faculty advisor stuff as well um and you might even see me on there as well with as a mentor as well so um that's like a six month really nice intensive but it gives goes through a lot of a lot of stuff but as these guys said as well shadowing other trainers helping out assisting just you know when we're allowed to be in person and doing in in classes and stuff just changing water balls you know moving beds around just bringing treats backwards and forwards mm-hmm. and just sitting and watching what goes on big you, you learn a lot just by sitting and watching Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I'm going to grab, Tam has got questions on her phone because she's been watching the live feed. So I'm going to grab that. Right. Um, da, 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 oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jack. So if I wanted to get into training as a career move post 40 um, with no desire to go back to uni, what would be my first step? I was considering doing an online course, but I'm not sure what prior experience you need to not need to be for that so someone uh, jack who's a, a client of ours um and i've talked to chat before about potentially moving across but i think you know we've plugged a few different opportunities haven't we a bit of volunteering a bit of getting yourself out there maybe pick up um one of the the reward-based training bodies you know there are others out there as well um Tom would give- know that Post, uh, Post post forties, Adam's speciality, I think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the hairline, isn't it? Is that what you're going for? <laughs> oh, it's not much better. I, do you know what? I, I suddenly, the more I look at myself on screen, the more I think I need to start pulling things forward a bit. Actually, not sweeping it back. Thanks, Tom. I'm through a lot more face wash these days. <laughs> you shouldn't let your age put you off from doing yeah, a career change. I, I know I say that as a young person, but I've seen so many people. Um, become dog trainers you know um, at any age so I really don't think that that should ever put you off um, I was going to say Tom would know the answer to this because I've gone blank on it but there was a, uh, a a group put together recently of um, good educational organizations that all kind of signed up for a group didn't they I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head but basically I think you're safe with basically any of those courses so I know that, what was that? It was the charter, you, wasn't it? You, you, the you charter, can, yeah. Charter, yeah. Because I do think that sometimes when you're just starting out, like you go online and you search dog training course and like it's really hard to know what's reputable or not. 
I think the dog training charter is a really good place to start because you pretty much can't really go wrong with any of those as a, as a starting place. I know Adam's already mentioned the APDT and BSPDT. Those are both reputable. It's also the I, IAABC. This, I know acronyms like <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Dog I like the CAKE. I really like CAKE. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's a place to start. Great. Yeah, and I think, like Nick said, there's acronyms everywhere. So the chart is really good because it's a group. So you can look at all of the individuals in that. And then the other one is the Animal Behaviour and Training Council because it's, again, it's a group of organisations. So you can look in both of those and think, oh, well, actually, within these groups, these are the people that seem to be most attractive to me. And you, you know that everybody in that group will be doing the right thing just in slightly different ways. So then it's going to give you the opportunity to know you're getting good information, but still find somebody that's going to suit, suit you and what you want out of it. Absolutely. Great. Um, question, more of a training based question. I hope you're happy to take training questions as well as sort of trainers questions. Um, how do I stop people from touch? How do you stop people from touching your dog? Even when I say no, she doesn't like it. Tell people they've got um, mange. <laughs> it's a really good one. Okay. That I use quite a lot. Okay. Yeah. Just um, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? And uh, how, my dog's all right with people, but it happened to me today. This, we walked past this um, older lady and she was touching the dog before I'd even kind of realized what was happening. Um, so, yeah, lots of people recommend the, the collars and things that I've don't touch on or the yellow dog project, which is a really cool project, but I, I still don't think the general public have, have that great an awareness of it at the minute, which is why sometimes like the yellow with writing on can be more effective but then you're still relying on somebody to look at the harness or the collar and, and see that and they'll probably still ignore it anyway um from a tra if we're putting our training hats on teaching something like a nice behind where the dog just goes and stands behind you on cue can be really a good way because you're taking the dog out of the situation um so we're helping the dog out by kind of saying well just come and stand behind me and then you can have that chat with the owner and explain why you don't want them touching the dog because there's a, there's a huge number of reasons isn't there that we might not want to do that i mean we get that with jonty a lot jonty being 42 kilos at a year old being a big breed you know people and people want to really touch him like oh, and they want to get in and ruffle his ears and actually for him that's like a big massive negative experience but because he's a big a big boy he should, you know, in people's mindsets, he should be able to take that, that. And that should be the sort of thing that he should enjoy. But for lots of dogs, contact, touch, you know, in, in those unpleasant places like their ears is massively um, hinders their social experiences, doesn't it? Massively. We, breed, we as a society breed breeds, but in their breed standards says suspicious to strangers. And then we expect them to be touched by strangers that makes no sense at all you know so anytime you have the guarding breeds that have been bred to be suspicious of strangers you know it's just such a um hypocrisy to them then expect random people to just be able to walk up to them and be their best friend absolutely right there guys um that was all the there, there will be some more questions and what i will do is I'll, I'll go through the comments and if you guys are happy to as well you know have a look at the feed and i know you've given up a lot of your time already but if you feel like commenting back on some of the questions that maybe we've missed um i just want to thank the three of you hugely for being the first episode of uh, chats with matt i've realized now that i've forgot to press the record button at the beginning but i can download the live so it's absolutely fine so i'm not going to make you do it all again because i was so excited to get going but thank you so much for um for being the first one i think we've covered some really good things and it was great i really wanted to start a conversation about you know our roots as as blokes chaps i've never really called myself a bloke to be honest, I'm not blokey at all. Um, lad. But, lad, lad, lads, um, into training, but it's, it's been great. I hope you guys watching have enjoyed it too. Please, what I li I'd like to do with all of these chats is those of you that are watching, if there has been a particular take home moment or a bit of a light bulb moment for you guys watching this, um, if you could pop it in the comments, uh, just so that maybe we can share those things with other people that are watching too, even if you're watching this on replay. If there's something that's gone ping in your brain or something that you think, oh, yeah, actually, 
have really taken that on board, pop it in the comments and um, that'd be good because we can start sharing some information. Also, anybody watching that wants to do another chat with Matt and has an interest in speaking about anything dog related, um, I am talking to a couple of people um, about the next episode of what it could be. So, um, yeah, and if any of you guys, you know, Tom, Nick or Adam want to come back and chat again, more than happy to come and chat with you guys. But anyway, I'm going to finish this live, guys. So thank you, everybody, for watching and um, we'll see you at the episode two. Cheers, guys. Bye for now. Cheers. See ya. See ya. Yeah.